Benvenuti a una nuova presentazione degli incontri sul senso 2019-2020, ovviamente sempre in, in versione online. Io sono Mattia Tivò, vi parlo dalla Finlandia, come suggerisce il, lo sfondo Zoom che vedete dietro di me, e in particolare lavoro presso l'Università di Tampere. La eh, presentazione eh, che eh, state seguendo è preparata e sarà presentata insieme eh, da me e da Oz Burke, noto anche come Oz, che è un mio collega del, dell'Università di Tampere, facciamo entrambi parte del, del Gamification Group, e eh, si intitola Digital Ecphrasis and Augmented Faces in the Transurban, eh, in italiano Ecphrasis Digitale e volte aumentate nel transurbano. Questa, eh, questa presentazione, che sarà anche multi, multilinguistica, in una parte sarà in italiano e poi passeremo all'inglese quando, quando si unirà a noi, è il frutto di un tentativo di ricerca eh, interdisciplinare tra eh, semiotica e eh, design che eh, si articola principalmente attorno all'idea di transurbanismo di cui avremo modo di parlare più avanti approfonditamente, ma che cerca di immaginare come, possono, come potrebbero essere delle città del futuro costruite per dei cittadini transumani. Questa, questa ricerca nasce anche dalla collaborazione tra due progetti di ricerca europei. Uno di essi si chiama Reclaim, è un progetto Marie Curie Individual Fellowship, di cui io sono beneficiario, e che si occupa di vedere come il gioco può risemantizzare gli spazi urbani e come gli, eh, i cittadini possono usare il gioco per eh, attuare delle vere e proprie procedure di scrittura e di riscrittura eh, degli spazi urbani. Il secondo progetto, anch'esso un Curie Individual Fellowship, si intitola Virtual, è eh, il progetto di, di Ose, quindi lascerò poi a lui il compito di spiegarvi meglio di che cosa si tratta. La presentazione di oggi sarà articolata in tre parti. Eh, come potete vedere abbiamo cercato di renderla una presentazione un po' eh, diversa dal solito, perché è un po' più interessante, visto che talvolta può essere un po' faticoso seguire, seguire queste presentazioni online. Per questo stiamo usando Zoom e come vedrete cercheremo di, di sfruttare un pochino le potenzialità andando avanti. E per questo usiamo tutto sommato poche slide. E, e come dicevo è articolato in tre parti. La prima che si intitola Facce e facciate, introduzione semiotica al volto nello spazio urbano, è eh, presentata da me e ehm, si propone principalmente di offrire alcuni eh, strumenti di semio, di semiotici molto semplici, alcuni come dire, una sorta di contestualizzazione e di offrire alcune chiavi di lettura anche per poi andare a leggere quella che sarà la seconda parte del, del, nostro, del nostro intervento, la terza. La seconda e la terza parte saranno invece in inglese, Oz ci raggiungerà qui su Zoom per, per parlare di questi argomenti. La prima si intitola Red by the City, Transurban Environment and Facial Recognition ed è eh, dedicata, come dice il titolo, appunto a, eh, agli effetti del riconoscimento facciale negli spazi cittadini, alle strategie che i cittadini oppongono talvolta a questi tentativi di riconoscimento. E sarà, diciamo, una presentazione a due un po' più classica, con, con delle slide e una sua struttura ben definita. L'ultima parte, invece, che si intitola Discussion, Augmented Faces, Masks and COVID-19, si concentrerà un pochino su quella che è la situazione attuale, che eh, diciamo non avevamo potuto immaginare ovviamente quando abbiamo preparato questa, quando abbiamo cominciato a pensare a come preparare questa, questa presentazione. E quindi eh, andremo a vedere un pochino come il fatto che eh, per esempio le, le mascherine siano diventate una parte fondamentale del paesaggio urbano e eh, della scrittura eh, del volto in, in moltissimi paesi, tra cui l'Italia, con in Finlandia la situazione non è eh, ancora, quantomeno, arrivata, arrivata a quei limiti, ma sappiamo che in tanti posti del mondo invece la mascherina ormai è parte della quotidianità. 
<coughs> e quest'ultima parte sarà un dialogo un pochino più aperto, non eccessivamente strutturato, in cui cerchiamo di presentare diversi casi di studio, diverse prospettive per riguardarli e in cui eh, appunto giocheremo un pochino anche con, per esempio, la capacità di riconoscimento facciale di Zoom, che permette di nascondere quello che c'è alle mie spalle, ma identifica il mio volto e, e ve lo mostra. Eh, quindi non ho altri slide per, per questa primissima, per la prima parte, quella dedicata al, alle facce e alle facciate, è una piccola di contestualizzazione semiotica e eh, un affetto del conchiere di lettura perché mi sembrava come dire, utile ridurre un pochino il numero di schermi eh, fra me e voi per cercare di rendere la, um, la presentazione un pochino, un pochino più scorrevole. Cercherò comunque di darvi riferimenti bibliografici completi così che se vogliate eh, poi andare a cercarvi i, i libri, gli articoli di cui vi parlo sia, eh, come dire, sia relativamente facile trovare online. Allora, iniziamo prima di tutto con alcuni cenni brevissimi di, di semiotica urbana. No? Parliamo eh, degli spazi urbani o transurbani, come vedremo. Eh, ovviamente la città non è un, um, un argomento nuovo per la semiotica. No, Bart, già nel 67, in semiologia urbanismo, parla della città come, come discorso. No? parla di una sorta di lingua della città con cui la città parla ai suoi cittadini e con cui i cittadini possono parlare la città. E dopo Bart molti altri, eh, molti altri semiotici si sono occupati eh, di città, non, non posso farvi un elenco completo, ma possiamo ricordare per, per esempio Benvenist, che nel 1970 in The Model Logistique de la Cité parla di enunciazioni pedonali, parla di come... Ehm, appunto si possa enunciare lo spazio urbano camminando, camminando attraverso di esso e come appunto muoversi attraverso una città attualizzi alcune delle possibilità della città mentre ne narcotizzi delle altre. Poi ovviamente è molto famoso Michel de Certeau quando parla della città come testo, di nuovo un testo che viene attualizzato dall'uso che ne fanno eh, i suoi cittadini e che eh, riecheggia un pochino la... La, la vicinanza lessicale che già esiste nell'espressione tessuto urbano, no? testo e tessuto, il tessuto urbano è già di per sé in qualche modo un testo. Più recentemente Ugo Volli, nei suoi numerosi lavori dedicati alla semiotica urbana, ricordiamo fra tutti nel 2008 eh, il testo della città, problemi metodologici e teorici, uscito, uscito su Lexia, in cui eh, cerca, diciamo, di mettere un po' d'ordine queste diverse suggestioni che ci vengono dallo studio semiotico della città e definisce la città come un discorso in quanto in continuo rinnovamento, in continua mutazione, assolutamente instabile, ma un discorso che in ogni momento, in ogni preciso istante, diciamo, è stabile e leggibile come un testo. E di cui quindi la semiotica può occuparsi in quest'ottica. Allora, si tratta certo di un testo molto particolare, no? la città è un testo assolutamente corale, è un testo polifonico, è un testo che è costruito da innumerevoli autori in un lasso di tempo che può essere appunto lunghissimo. E, è un testo, un testo che quindi è caratterizzato da un'eterogeneità strutturale importantissima. La città è un testo organico, è riconoscibile come un tutt'uno, possiamo riconoscere Londra, Torino, Helsinki, ma al contempo all'interno della città abbiamo una, una pletora di eh, testi di scala diversa affiancati gli uni agli altri. E quindi abbiamo un grandissimo numero di oggetti di senso che sono tutti eh, individuabili, analizzabili separatamente ma che tutti insieme costruiscono anche questo insieme organico. Ehm, Lotman, a questo proposito, Lotman anche si occupa molto di, di semiotica urbana, anche se spesso per via un po' traverse, e eh, in un articolo dell'87, eh, l'architettura nel contesto della cultura, edito, edito anche in Italia eh, nel Girotondo delle Muse, 
eh, parla proprio di come nella città si perda un pochino la differenza fra testo e contesto e di come per esempio un edificio, soprattutto un monumento, un edificio particolare, può fornire da contesto a tutto il quartiere che ci sta attorno. E quindi se pensiamo a, non lo so, a tutto il quartiere dell'Etoile intorno al, all'Arc de Triomphe a Parigi, tutto questo quartiere è risemantizzato, assume un nuovo significato, dei nuovi livelli di significato grazie alla presenza del, dell'Arc de Triomphe al suo centro. E quindi oggetti di scala più piccoli, più piccola, possono trasformarsi in contesto per oggetti e per spazi di scala anche molto maggiore. E come vedremo questo c'entra anche quando, quando pensiamo e quando parliamo del volto della città. Um, questa, questo testo complicato di cui abbiamo parlato, in cui appunto si perdono le, eh, le chiare distinzioni fra testo e contesto, è anche un testo, eh, oltre a che appunto, come abbiamo detto, corale e polifonico, che presenta una serie di stratificazioni. Abbiamo prima di tutto ovviamente una stratificazione storica, allora, nelle città europee spesso abbiamo un centro storico, per esempio, con, eh, con degli edifici più antichi. Tante volte abbiamo una stratificazione anche eh, storica dal punto di vista geologico, ovvero abbiamo delle fondamenta al di sotto del, del terreno, al di sotto delle strade percorribili, formato da rovine di edifici più antichi. E abbiamo la stratificazione storica anche nel, nel ritmo con cui la città cambia e si modifica. Abbiamo eh, parti morfologiche della città che magari non cambiano nell'arco di secoli, come per esempio l'orientamento della pianta stradale. Abbiamo appunto oggetti come gli edifici che possono durare centinaia di anni. Abbiamo eh, oggetti che invece hanno durate molto più brevi. Pensiamo per esempio ai pannelli pubblicitari che rimangono soltanto per, per qualche giorno, al massimo qualche settimana o infine la presenza effimera dei cittadini, dei veicoli che passano attraverso la città e si muovono continuamente. Ma abbiamo anche delle stratificazioni che non sono storiche, bensì ideologiche e talvolta politiche. Il costruire eh, la cattedrale al centro della città o il costruire eh, l'edificio più alto eh, posseduto per esempio da una banca. Tutti questi tentativi di eh, posizionarsi in posizioni centrali, in posizioni di prestigio, anche costruiscono una, una stratificazione appunto ideologica all'interno della città. E in qualche modo il potere politico, i diversi poteri che si incontrano nella città, si scontrano anche proprio sulla capacità di scrivere la città. E quindi possiamo pensare a, a Manhattan con, a, con la competizione fra Empire State Building e Chrysler Building per essere l'edificio più alto del mondo, ma eh, anche la nostra Bologna con appunto eh, le diverse torri che competevano per essere le più alte già, già nel Medioevo e, e nel Rinascimento. E, come alcuni di voi avranno probabilmente già immaginato, visto che parliamo di stratificazione, di posizioni di prestigio, eh, c'è anche una, come dire, un isomorfismo tra la pianta cittadina e la semisfera. Lodman ne parla in Universe of the Mind, nel capitolo che dedica alla nozione di confine, in cui eh, approfondisce un pochino eh, le possibili somiglianze tra la semisfera e la città e dice appunto come la città spesso è un tentativo di rappresentare la semisfera. E quindi ciò che poniamo al centro della città, ciò che poniamo alla periferia della città, spesso rispecchia quelli che sono i valori o le pratiche che consideriamo più importanti e quelle che consideriamo periferiche. Ma appunto le periferie cittadine non sono necessariamente soltanto, eh, come dire, i luoghi più lontani dal centro fisicamente. Per esempio la notte è una periferia cittadina che è spesso abitata da figure periferiche, dai ladri, dai giovani, eh, dai, dai disadattati. E qualcosa di simile può essere detto per esempio per gli androni, per le soffitte, per zone di confine degli edifici che diventano anche zone di confine della semiosfera. E quindi da questa, da questa corrispondenza stretta che abbiamo tra semisfera e morfologia urbana, vediamo bene come ogni città è un prodotto della propria cultura, 
e ne rispecchia appunto la storia, abbiamo detto la politica e eh, le diverse gerarchie ideologiche. Ma ogni città è ovviamente anche una produttrice di cultura, è un meccanismo che costruisce senso e che costruisce cultura e che costruisce tra le altre cose i cittadini stessi. Se pensiamo a molte parole come urbano, civile, o il francese poli, e in inglese polite, che vogliono dire ben educato, abbiamo tante parole che sono etimologicamente eh, connesse con le parole, le radici greche e latine per città, che indicano delle, indicano delle persone che si comportano dovere, che si comportano in un modo socialmente accettabile. Quindi la città produce cultura e produce cittadini. Se eh, all'interno della città diamo un po' il volto, occorre allora eh, come dire, soffermarsi molto rapidamente anche sulla semiotica del volto. You know, la semiotica del volto eh, è una semiotica che deve andare a costruirsi in un certo modo in un secondo livello, nel senso che nel, nel volto, nel riconoscimento, nel nostro riconoscere il volto altrui, c'è anche molto di, di presemiotico, no? qualcosa basato su, uh, sulla nostra natura, sulla nostra evoluzione e su come riconosciamo uh, delle facce appunto molto prima di imparare qualsiasi tipo di linguaggio. E, cioè nonostante la semiotica ha qualcosa da dire sulle facce, soprattutto quando si comincia a creare un senso attorno alle facce o tramite le facce che non è appunto quello... Um, come dire, banale, potremmo dire in un certo senso, emergente dalla, dalla nostra natura. Ed effettivamente la semiotica se ne è occupata spesso, Bart si è occupato anche di volto quando parla per esempio del volto di Greta Garbo nei, nei miti d'oggi, no, del concetto del volto come qualcosa di intravestibile. Patrizia Magli ha dedicato eh, numerosi libri al, alla semiotica del volto e anche proprio questi incontri sul senso due anni fa Uh, furono dedicati proprio alla semiotica del volto, quindi uh, incoraggio chiunque non, uh, non li abbia visti ad andare a, um, a rivedersi alcuni dei video uh, di questi interventi, alcuni erano appunto molto interessanti e fornivano già un'idea secondo me molto chiara di, uh, di che cosa può essere la semiotica del volto e ovviamente oggi abbiamo uh, il progetto IRC Facet guidato da, da Massimo Leone che si occupa proprio della semiotica del volto nella contemporaneità. <coughs> Ci sono tuttavia alcune idee che mi piacerebbe richiamare qui perché di nuovo secondo me possono offrire degli spunti di lettura interessanti per quello di cui andremo a parlare più avanti. Allora la prima è eh, il lavoro di, di Levinas, in particolare il libro Totalità Infinì del 61, che appunto è un libro fondamentale, seminale, sul volto, in cui Levina parla del, del volto proprio come eh, caratteristica fondamentale per comunicare la propria umanità, no? e eh, ovviamente per ricevere l'umanità altrui attraverso, attraverso il volto. Questa posizione viene poi criticata in parte da Deleuze e Guettari, dicendo che è una posizione molto occidentale, e su questo ci può essere del vero, ci sono ovviamente dei trattamenti diversi, culturalmente diversi del, del volto, di quanto del volto si può e si deve mostrare, e anche di questo vedremo, vedremo dell'eco in cui ne parleremo più avanti. Ma Levina, secondo me, propone anche una, una differenziazione che è fondamentale per, per questa prima parte della nostra presentazione, che è quella la differenza fra eh, faccia e facciata. No, la facciata o facade è la facciata degli edifici e a differenza della faccia è un'interfaccia un, un controllabile. È possibile appunto manipolare più facilmente la facciata che non deve necessariamente corrispondere a quello che c'è dentro. Per Levinas invece la faccia è qualcosa che eh, ci sfugge su cui non possiamo avere un controllo completo. E questo riecheggia in modo interessante, secondo me, in un'affermazione che fa Patrizia Magli, eh, nel suo libro del 2013, Il pitturare il volto, il trucco, l'arte e la moda, edito Marsilio, di cui vi cito, qui vi leggo un, un, brevissimo, un brevissimo pezzo. Allora, Patrizia Magli scrive La bocca è, infatti, la parte del viso che meno riusciamo a governare. 
per la sua elasticità è sottoposta a campi di forza che ne possono deformare l'aspetto malgrado la nostra volontà. Accade talvolta di non riuscire a controllarne i muscoli, rivelando in questo modo ciò che avremmo voluto tenere più segreto. Ne consegue, così che, eh, ne consegue che, così sfacciati, si finisce col perdere la faccia. Allora, Patrizia Maglia, secondo me, qui eh, fa emergere due situazioni, due, due componenti interessanti della semiotica del volto. La prima è quella eh, del fatto che il volto non è pienamente controllabile, ci sfugge dal controllo. Quindi sì, è un oggetto semiotico, possiamo mentire tramite il volto, eh, se vogliamo usare appunto la famosa, il famoso test di Umberto Eco eh, per determinare cose di, semio, di interesse semiotico o meno, ma al contempo talvolta riesce a comunicare delle cose senza che noi lo vogliamo. <coughs> C'è un esempio che io trovo molto interessante e che riguarda la, la cosiddetta metacomunicazione del gioco, che è un principio eh, che elabora Gregory Bateson eh, nel, nel suo libro del 56 dedicato al messaggio a questo gioco, Gary Bateson dice che il comunicare la propria intenzione ludica è uno degli, eh, dei messaggi più complessi che gli, umani, che gli animali non umani si trasmettono in modo da eh, come dire, guidare le loro, le loro interazioni. Ed è interessante vedere come i bambini, i bambini piccoli, non riescono a scherzare, a mentire, a fare uno scherzo senza sorridere, senza ridere. Sono traditi dal proprio volto. <coughs> Proprio per queste, queste, questi campi di forza, come, come li chiama Patrizia Magli, che a volte riescono a sconvolgere l'aspetto del nostro viso anche al di là del nostro controllo. E questo di nuovo è un tema, è un tema su cui torneremo più avanti. E il secondo eh, tema importante, secondo me, è quello del perdere la faccia. No? La faccia, come ci ricorda per esempio anche a Monterey in La razionalità strategica eh, nel, nel 90, <coughs> non è altro che l'immagine, l'immagine pubblica di un sé, è l'interfaccia con cui incontriamo gli altri e con cui interagiamo con gli altri. Se andiamo quindi a vedere come appunto il volto e la città si, si incontrano, beh, <coughs> vediamo semplicemente, immediatamente, che le facciate sono piene di facce, ci sono moltissimi volti disegnati nella città. Abbiamo pubblicità, abbiamo manifesti elettorali, abbiamo madonnai che disegnano il volto, il volto della Madonna, per esempio, sul marciapiede. Abbiamo moltissimi volti scolpiti. Abbiamo statue, mezze busti, eh, targhe, bassorilievi, edicole con, con immagini dei santi. Se eh, provate, per esempio, a recarvi in una qualunque città barocca e guardarvi attorno, scoprirete un incredibile numero di facce che vi ossangono. Se per esempio a Torino andate, andate in piazza San Carlo e provate a contare il numero di facce di pietra che vi fissano quando siete, quando siete nella piazza, vedrete che sono molte più di cento, talmente tante che non le notiamo neanche più. E similmente anche ovviamente la presenza fisica e significante dei cittadini comporta una presenza di volti nel tessuto urbano. Questi volti sono ovviamente un oggetto di senso tra moltissimi altri, e abbiamo di nuovo quindi una forma di, di censura per accumulazione. Quasi. Noi ci troviamo a essere un volto tra la folla e quindi quasi anonimi, poi portando la nostra identità e mostrandola al mondo. Ma la città è anche comunque lo spazio dell'incontro con l'altro. Tanto che nella nostra cultura, di nuovo nella cultura occidentale, il nascondere il volto è una cosa che spesso viene considerata come in qualche modo extraculturale è qualcosa che sta al di fuori o al limite, sul confine della nostra semisfera. Allora copre il suo volto la donna islamica, anche se spesso appunto questo produce come dire, disagio e invoglia alcuni, alcuni governi a proibire eh, il velo islamico che copre, che copre il volto. Si copre la faccia del rapinatore, che vive al di fuori dei confini della legge. Ma nelle narrazioni, ma non solo, anche il supereroe si copre il volto, si copre il volto perché appunto vive al di fuori delle regole eh, della società, vive sui tetti o, o sottoterra e via dicendo. Quindi la faccia è un oggetto che si deve mostrare all'interno della città proprio perché è la nostra interfaccia con, con la società, 
con la cultura che quella città eh, esprime e rappresenta. E veniamo così allora all'idea di ecstasy digitale, eh, che appunto abbiamo anche menzionato nel, nel titolo di questa presentazione, e eh, che ha molto a che vedere, come vedremo, anche con il modo con cui portiamo e usiamo la faccia negli spazi, negli spazi urbani di oggi. Allora, l'ecfrasi, come, come sapete tutti, è eh, prima di tutto quel processo di eh, descrivere delle opere d'arte, siano esse pittoriche o scultoriche, attraverso eh, una descrizione verbale, parlata oppure scritta, e quindi si tratta essenzialmente di una traduzione intersemiotica. Per quanto una traduzione intersemiotica eh, molto complessa da effettuare. Ehm, è interessante vedere come di Ecfasi si parla appunto fin dall'antichità classica e eh, è usato dai greci per eh, come dire, dimostrare la, <coughs> come dire, il, il vantaggio che ha il logos, il vantaggio che ha la parola sopra tutte le altre forme di, di arte, ma è qualcosa che sta anche, eh, come dire, che emerge da eh, quello che Krieger eh, chiama eh, in Ecphrasis the Illusion of the Natural Sign, 1992. Continuo appunto a darvi dei riferimenti bibliografici vocali, così possiate trovarvi se vi interessano. Appunto Krieger parla di un impulso ecfrastico, no? un desiderio di eh, tradurre in parole gli oggetti artistici. E eh, questo si collega ovviamente a, al logocentrismo di Derrida. <coughs> Derrida appunto dice che appena la cultura inventa un sistema di segni arbitrario, nasce subito questo desiderio di ridurre la distanza tra significato e significante. E, e l'ecfrasi eh, è, è uno di questi strumenti, un modo appunto di cercare di ridurre delle cose in realtà molto difficili da descrivere tramite la parola, ha appunto descrizioni logocentriche. Eh, questo, secondo me, si collega anche in modo abbastanza interessante a eh, qualcosa che dice Lotman in Universe of the Mind, eh, nel libro del, uscito in inglese nel 1990, quando parla dell'interazione tra testi discreti e testi continui e quindi anche tra linguaggi discreti e linguaggi continui. In questo caso, quindi, eh, l'arte art, visiva, che sia appunto pittorica o scultorica, è un testo continuo, e il tentativo di tradurlo in linguaggio scritto, in linguaggio verbale, è un tentativo di trasformarlo in un testo discreto. Mm? Eh, la traduzione tra questi due tipi di, di testi e di linguaggi, secondo Lotman, è a rigore di logica impossibile non possiamo tradurre un testo continuo perfettamente in un testo discreto. Quello che possiamo fare, secondo Lockman, è soltanto sostituire il primo testo con un secondo testo, che descrive in qualche modo lo stesso oggetto, ma che è sempre una cosa nuova, una cosa diversa. Questo per Lotman ha molto valore, perché per Lotman appunto la semiosi è una cosa ehm, dire, a, cui la cultura, ehm, a cui la cultura appunto mira hm, a incrementare la semiosi il più possibile, ma ci mostra anche come se le traduzioni, come appunto sempre Lotman ci ricorda, sono sempre, sono sempre imperfette, c'è sempre lo spazio di traducibilità, nel caso dell'Ecfesi questo spazio è ancora più grande. Allora, di cosa parliamo quando parliamo di ecfrasi digitale? Parliamo del, dell'idea, dell'impulso, di nuovo un impulso ecfrastico, eh, marinato in qualche senso in, eh, in una prospettiva positivista, che ci porta a tentare di digitalizzare gli oggetti del mondo. Digitalizzare non soltanto riprodurre tramite foto, ricostruzioni, ma anche trovare dei modi con cui sia possibile automare, automatizzare la, eh, il riconoscimento degli oggetti. Quindi tutti quegli algoritmi, spesso basati sul machine learning, che tentano appunto di riconoscere in un'immagine 
che cos'è un semaforo, che cos'è una bicicletta, eccetera. Le conosciamo tutti perché appunto aiutiamo tramite i CAPTCHA che eh, ci vengono proposti online, aiutiamo tutti alla costruzione di questi algoritmi. Tentano appunto di costruire delle, eh, delle, dei pattern, di costruire delle descrizioni, dei, delle serie di procedure che permettano alle macchine di riconoscere gli oggetti. E questo è qualcosa che facciamo, che stiamo, che stiamo facendo, anche con un certo successo, anche con i volti. No? Parliamo quindi delle tecnologie di riconoscimento facciale. Il volto in questo caso è un testo continuo, per usare il linguaggio di Lotman, che viene tradotto da dei sensori, da degli algoritmi, in un linguaggio discreto, quindi un codice che permette il riconoscimento di questo testo. Ovviamente questi, questa traduzione, come abbiamo detto, crea dei vuoti, che nonostante anche la sofisticatezza di, di alcuni di questi, di questi dispositivi, possono talvolta essere utilizzati. Possiamo utilizzare questi vuoti, possiamo farlo per esempio per sbloccare il telefono di qualcun altro utilizzando la sua fotografia, o possiamo utilizzarlo, come vedremo, come vedremo a breve, per eh, ingannare i eh, servizi, i eh, dispositivi di riconoscimento facciale di cui le nostre città sono eh, al momento sempre, sempre più piene. Ecco, con questa presentazione spero di eh, aver offerto una serie di, di spunti e di, di strumenti semiotici che potremmo appunto applicare poi a tutta una serie di, di esempi, di casi di studio che eh, adesso andremo, andremo a toccare insieme a Oz, che, eh, che quindi ci raggiungerà eh, in questo momento. Ok, so we will now switch to English for the rest of this presentation, for its second and third part, and uh, we welcome Oz Muruk, uh, aka Oz, that will be my co-presenter for the rest of, of the presentation. Welcome, Oz. Hello, and uh, sorry for ruining your uh, beautiful Italian presentation <laughs> with, with, with my English participation, but anyway, uh, now we're more diverse. <laughs> yeah. It's good exercise. So, uh, Oz, like myself, works at Tampere University, and uh, we will now show you a small slide in which we start to introduce yourself. And uh, without further ado, we will start the second part of this presentation that is more of still a sort of classical um, presentation with some slides and that will be dedicated, uh, as I said before, mostly to uh, facial recognition in the urban and the trans-urban scenario. Uh, this presentation via Zoom is sort of an experiment. So we hope it will be working all right. But uh, yeah, I mean, we already know that there will be some, um, you know, some technical issues. That, that's how it works, so please be patient. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you already know of Reclaim, which is uh, my research project. I told you something uh, before about it. And uh, the other big project that participates to the creation of this presentation is work, which is Oz project, and I will let him to tell you something about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, virtual is also a project that's funded uh, by Marie Curie Grant. And uh, this project is dedicated uh, for designing and developing and find ways of actually designing and developing wearable devices for virtual reality environments. Uh, and of course, the wearable parts of it has a lot of layers. Uh, this is why we came together with Mattia. So uh, I will also elaborate a little bit what's, uh, well, what, what wearables means and how they can play out in our now uh, enhanced technological environment in the cities. Uh, so uh, this wearable part of the project is how we met in the, in the middle with Matthias Reclaim project. Yes, and this is really sort of a, an attempt <coughs> to interdis of inter interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, dialogue, because I am, of course, a semiotician, but Oz is not. Oz is a, is a designer. 
And so we sort of wanted also to see how around this topic, how different disciplines can inform each other, build on each other, and hopefully, you know, create something new and interesting. Yeah. Okay, so maybe also you want to say something as we're speaking about transurbanism and transhumanism. You want to say, tell us something about uh, what transhumanism is. Okay, let's 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 start with that. Uh, we will talk about a really far far future, and let's hope Zoom will at least respond us with good technological support here. <laughs> good, I could change the slide uh, with remote control. So here is uh, we're starting to uh, actually introduce the transhumanism first to understand about transurbanism, and uh, as you as as you know, uh, we as humans have some limits. We have some capacity, and actually, transhumanism envisions to extend this capacity uh, in in places in, in extents that we cannot maybe imagine right now. Uh, for example, the first thing that comes uh, with transhumanistic thinking is to improve our bodies and physical builds so we can uh, live much, much more uh, longer than what we can do right now. So I think, of course, our age limit is not 122, but I think this was a number that I could find the most lived person. Maybe it's wrong, but anyway, it's a very long time, uh, long time span for now. So, uh, but with transhumanism, then maybe it will go a thousand years more and even to immortality. This is what actually uh, transhumanist envisions, but of course there's a long way there but this is where they want to go and maybe where we want to go. But of course, apart from lifespan, other things can be improved in the body, right? We can, for example, uh, implement new technologies that will enhance our sensory model modalities, which, for example, we can see maybe further, we can hear better, or we can sense the environment uh, through our skin in a more sophisticated than, uh, sophisticated than we do now. Of course, other thing is maybe improving the physical strength of the body. So with maybe additional robotic limbs, then we can start carrying weights that it is impossible right now, or we can standing and running in high pace throughout the all day without feeling any fatigue. Other part is the intellectual capacity. So when we increase the intellectual capacity, then our brains can be embedded with chips. The processing power can be improved. We, have, we can have an immense memory and we can even connect our minds to internet and uh, <laughs> create an internet, internet of citizens or humans. And the last thing that uh, transhumanist envision is to enhance mood or self-control. So we will always be in a desirable emotional state or we can alter our emotional state according to how we feel, depending on uh, different kinds of situations to uh, feel emotions and experiences that we cannot even imagine today. So then, then we come to cities of course, maybe you already understand, but what we envision, what will happen to cities when we replace human citizens with transhuman citizens. And this is our, I don't know, regular boring city that we have right now, but with the transhumans inside, maybe it will also uh, allow a lot of different kind of uh, modifications. So currently, all our frameworks are built around how we live our life today and what cities look like today. But with transhumans inside the cities, it can dramatically change. So we wanted to create this transurban framework uh, by putting together some of the main facets of smart cities, such as design, management, and social aspects of it, and also by putting together the new features, new properties, or new abilities of transhumanisms in terms of physical, mental, and emotional enhancements. So this is, 
how we want to think, then how, for example, what kind of profilations uh, will come out when we match uh, physical build of transhumans when the management side of the city, or how will the design of the cities will change when there are mentally enhanced transhumans live inside them. So here, uh, of course, then I will give the word to Mattia so he can also uh, comment on the semiotic aspect of it. So how will the meanings of the cities will also change? Thank you. Yes, so we have seen uh, in the introduction a little bit how the city is already a very complex semiotic device, it's an engine of meaning making, and it's, you know, the intersection of many practices and textualities and science that come together and stay next to each other and are context to each other, increasing each other meanings. So cities are already and have always been very rich um, ensembles of uh, semiotic activities, activities of interpretation and practices, etc. But already today's boring city, in fact, has something more than the traditional city. Now, the smart cities that are, you know, slowly being implemented around the world also have a sensory dimension. So, if we always looked at the city, if you know, in the traditional city, I lost the slide. Yeah, if in the traditional city. Uh, we used to be the actant observers. We used to be the one that moving around the city would look at it, would interpret it, would make sense of what they see. The smart city changed this paradigm. It becomes a panopticum city. It used all these sensors to look at us all the time, to track what you're doing, to track, you know, smart cities are full of sensors, a sensor for air quality or traffic conditions, etc but also, uh, for example, facial recognition is becoming quite a big thing, especially, but not only uh, in China. So we stop being only actant observers and we also become actant observed while actant, because everything we do, even our mere presence in the city is already an action, being recorded to be in a certain place, in a certain neighborhood, in a certain event, let's say a protestation, for example, is already an action, just being there and be recorded being there, it's already uh, something that can be considered an action and can have consequences on us. So cities, smart cities especially, acquire this also sensory dimension. There are cities that observe us and they become sort of panoptical cities, cities in which we are observed all the time. And that's why uh, I always uh, like to show this image. I think it's a very good image because we have this idea that Smart cities are something sexy, are something attractive, are something nice. We want to go towards it. No? We want to have more technology in our city. But at the same time, we can see that there is something off. No? They can be a little bit creepy. There is this aspect of surveillance that emerges from, from smart cities, that it's a little bit, uh, a little bit scary. And while we, uh, we will generally try to focus on public spaces, uh, we also wanted to uh, show you this Bali from Samsung. This is uh, a ball with a camera that follows you around your house. So while you, you, know, you go about your daily life, these balls just roll, over, roll about, follows you and record everything. And uh, so we could imagine that we're not that far from having you know, Google Maps or Google Street View of the inside of our own houses. So these sort of sensors, this camera that, that are looking at us all the time, are sort of invading uh, private spaces too. But when we think about public spaces, we see that this uh, observation, this panoptical that we're building, is not always met with enthusiasm by the citizens. These uh, videos and images from the Hong Kong protests that happened uh, most last year, um, showing protesters tearing down uh, towers, uh, facial recognition towers, were very powerful because they saw, they, they showed how the power can drive the city and put its eyes and its, you know, panopticon engines around the city and how citizens could respond even violently in order to protect the right of protesting without being arrested and identified and, um, and prosecuted. So um, one of the possible reactions of citizens, and this is what we will uh, try to 
explore a little bit in this part of the presentation is to step up the technological game. So if the city moved to a smart city and then to a panoptical city, human citizens could transform themselves in transurban act and observe, in transurban, transhuman citizens that use transhuman technologies to augment themselves, to augment their bodies so that the panoptical city cannot recognize them anymore. And uh, before going in, into detail in some of these examples, uh, Oz will tell us something about enclosed cognition. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it might be a little bit unclear right now than how actually we're connecting uh, this uh, to clothes at, at the end of the day. But what we will talk about here is, is the identity, because now the faces are read by the city and then if you're trying to remove them or if you try to hide them so what happens to our identity uh, and do you think that for example it would affect covering your face uh, or covering your face would affect your identity so this encoded cognition is a quite uh, famous experiment in, in in psychology in terms of how clothes affects uh, our perception about ourselves and this might actually provide at least a slight answer, uh, saying that yes, it might. In encoded cognition, uh, so in, in this study, experimenters uh, decided to understand if what we wear uh, really affects how we think. So they created an experiment setup that they test uh, three different participant groups. In one of the participant groups, they gave them a lab coat and said them, told them that it's a doctor's coat. And for the other group, they gave the, them the same lab coat, but this time they said, they told it's an artist's coat. And in the third group, they just gave the doctor coat, but they said they shouldn't wear it, but just put it uh, on the tray and look at it. So then they applied, uh, several tests to understand their uh, attention span and actually the participants who supposed that they were wearing doctor's coat showed heightened attention to tasks that uh, given to them uh, and there are several more studies like that that verifies these results and it's a very interesting take it's 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 an interesting thing that's showing actually what you wear and even beyond that what you think you wear uh, affects how you behave and who you are. Even if you're not a, doc not a doctor, you just transform into at least uh, a hypothetical doctor at that time and try to behave as if one. So then um, how it relates to other types of variables and uh, what do we do in the variable field uh, that's, uh, play, that, that, that plays on the identity? There are really interesting examples when it comes to it. For example, this monarch is uh, in the class and category of expressive variables. So its functional qualities are not much. The only thing it do is when you uh, squeeze or push the buttons, the shoulders sw swelled. And it is just a device that can be used in kind of a social encounters, for example, to intimidate the person you are talking to, or maybe showing your excitement about a specific topic. And this is now a new example. It was just a lab coat before. Now it's an electronic device that actually changes the silhouette of your body to change how you communicate with people. And of course you can expand that. And uh, when you expand that, it can go even these kind of products, such as spider dress. Spider dress is also, of course, an experimental product, but the idea behind it is interesting because it gives the impression to outsiders telling that don't come close to me because it also has this proximity sensors. And when you come closer, this uh, spider leg starts moving and uh, intimidates the person who comes comes closer. So it's a manifesto immediately. It's an expression of self. It's a very clear message saying that stay away. 
or I can hurt you. So uh, then this, all these examples are for showing variables are not just devices for tracking, for example, our body data, or they're not just smartwatches that we can check our emails or text messages through them, but they are part of the identity. And this identity can be manipulated through also these new expressions that can be created by these computational materials. So then when it comes to cities, how does it play with the face? What uh, does covering our face or playing with our face uh, do to our identity or does it affect our identity at all? Yes, um, of course, the face is an interesting space of writing. Now, we are seeing with this uh, small presentation on encoded cognition and wearables how the semiotic aspect of it is already very important. No? The same lab code can have very different effects if we interpret in different ways. And if we add technology to it, it can even more change the way we express ourselves and as we are uh, interpreted by others. Faces, of course, are uh, also spaces of drawing. No? Faces are not something natural. Faces are something that we, we create, we make also with our culture and that we already have several ways of augmenting that are very basic and very, uh, very used. We can think, for example, of makeup. So drawing and coloring and painting our faces to look better or to convey even some form of identities. No? What kind of makeup I wear uh, identifies what kind of social situation I can be in or even what kind of job I'm doing, for example, if I am a, a sex worker and so on or an actor, for example, etc. At the same time, also, for example, bears and, you know, giving a shape to our bears and using it as a symbol of masculinity, as a symbol of a hipster identity or many other things. It's something very expressive. These are things that used to be very gendered, but are becoming more and more blurred. So that men often wear makeup and women can sometimes have birds so these forms of face writing are very common. Other forms of face writing are generally related to the playful sphere. So we have, for example, cosplays or carnival or sporting events for supporters or Halloween. So all moments of play in which we can write our face in a non-definitive manner. We can paint it just for that situation and then clean it, wash it clean after and continue to our daily lives. Forms of um, long-lasting face writing, of course, do exist, but they still encounter some quite strong stigma. So maybe some artists can do it, but most of the time, these sort of tattoos, these facial tattoos, identify the owners as someone uh, that is sort of a criminal or a thug. And general people with face tattoos have huge problems, for example, landing a job, because they do not look trustworthy. So the ways in which we write our faces uh, are many. And uh, if we want to put more technology in it, and if we want to bring it to the uh, urban environment and in the panopticon city, well, we can first try to map a little bit what are the elements that are at play here. So we have, uh, on the one hand, we have our face, which is sort of uh, the well, the, the first signifying surface that is part of this, uh, this relationship, and that, of course, is used to identify us. Then we have a pattern, something that the sensors of the city are looking for, that is a basic shape of a face, and the typical traits that identify the owner of this face and that help uh, taking this face apart from all the other faces. And then, of course, we have the channel, no, the sort of fetic relationship between the sensor and the person, general infrared uh, rays that are uh, produced and then uh, perceived by the sensor in order to identify us. So if we look at this map and these three main, um, these three main uh, key points, we can see how the strategies to augment our faces, to escape the panopticon city, to avoid being recognized, can be also articulated along these three different types. So we can have, for example, on the one hand, 
uh, what we can call site trackers. So we can multiply our face, our faces around our face, so that the sensor cannot really easily understand what is a face and what not, and which face they should focus on in order to identify it. <coughs> we have therefore um, garments like this uh, anonymous hoodie or scarf by Sun Weakers that being covered by pictures of other faces makes it difficult for a machine to understand which is the face that they should identify, while for humans it's still quite obvious. We also have, for example, the hyperface clothing by Adam Harvey, which is uh, a pattern that can be printed on t-shirts, scarves, uh, jackets, whatever, whatever kind of accessory of, or uh, clothing, also in order to um, sidetrack the, um, uh, the sensors. So we can see here the faces are not very clear, but this is enough to make it harder also to understand, for example, the distance and what the sensor should focus on. We have then several forms of camouflage. I can simply cover the face, cover the signifying surface, in order for the machine not to be able to see it anymore and therefore to uh, individuate it. So many of these examples still try to keep, for example, some transparency, like surveillance exclusion, this, uh, this image we're seeing now. So this is something that is transparent enough that other humans can recognize it, but it modifies the uh, shape of the face enough to make it unrecognizable for machines. <clears throat> we also have this uh, example like Pixel Head by Martin Bakis, the sort of uh, metaphorically bring pixelation, which is something that is generally used on pictures in order not to make uh, recognizable people, uh, for example, online or on uh, newspapers, etc. when it brings it in the real world. And so pixelates in the real world the face so that the uh, machines cannot recognize it. This is also a very interesting uh, example, it's wearable face projector by Jin Kai Liu. Uh, this uh, is a device that projects several moving faces on the face of, um, of the person that wears it. And even for humans, there are videos online, you can, you can check them. It's very difficult to understand which one is the real face. <clears throat> because several faces are superimposed to each other, moving all the time, changing all the time. It's really, really confusing. But of course, these examples are not uh, you know, necessarily so nice to wear because we don't want to look too weird in the city. We have talked before, our city is sort of a stage, a place in which we represent ourselves. So we do not necessarily want to wear a weird you know, mask that make us look ugly or unrecognizable. So some projects, like here we see CV Dazzle by Adam Harvey, try to make it fashionable, try to make it uh, attractive, try to make it interesting. So for example, using haircuts or makeup in order to make us unrecognizable, but also to keep us, let's say, stylish. There is also jewelry. For example, this work by Ewa Nowak that uh, can be worn by, by people, that can, again, have some sort of style, can be interesting, can be pleasing, can be you know, aesthetically meaningful, but at the same time is able to, um, to stop um, facial recognition technologies to work. And we can finally also just try to stop the, uh, the channel that the um, uh, surveillance systems are using to see our faces. We can do this, for example, by projecting infrared light towards the sensor. This privacy visor by Alzheimer's is a way of, uh, again, not being recognized by the machine because it cannot see us, because we sort of project too much light in front of them. <coughs> also, in this case, there are attempts of making these objects a little bit more fashionable, something that looks less like a statement against a facial recognition and more like an everyday object that I can use, but that also at the same time stops facial recognition. These uh, reflectacles uh, called ghosts are simply, uh, you know, more or less normal sunglasses that at the same time are able to reflect very efficiently infrared light. And in this way also they uh, dazzle, they uh, stop the facial recognition systems from seeing our faces. So we see how augmented our faces and becoming transhuman, act and observed, 
is a way of stopping the panopticon city. But at the same time, we can very well imagine that the panopticon city will also escalate this sort of game. And so we'll try to use more technology in order to recognize eyes despite the masks or other things that we can wear on our faces. And so the panopticon city can become a transurban panopticon city. So a city that is made to uh, adapt to transhuman, transhuman citizens. And um, with these, we finish the first part of our common presentation. So I will stop sharing the screen. And uh, of course, when we were presenting this, uh, when, when we were preparing this presentation at the beginning, we focused especially on facial recognition because we didn't, we couldn't really imagine how another kind of wearable technology that concerns the face would become so mainstream just a few months later. And I'm talking, of course, of uh, sanitary masks that now, due to the COVID-19 situation, are becoming so common in, um, in, well, everywhere in the world. In some places, they're even, uh, you know, mandatory. We have to wear these masks in order to be able to go out. And these, of course, also have a, a quite, quite interesting effect because, again, this is something that we wear in public spaces. And so it is something that affects also how we um, per are perceived in the city spaces and how we perceive the city spaces. Again, this is not something that is made for digital exercises. It's not something that we do to stop the city from reading us, but it is indeed something that impairs digital exercises. Because if we wear this sort of masks, we cannot be, we cannot be recognized. Which is quite interesting. And we have seen you know, many different sort of interesting masks. Uh, do you have some examples that you would like to talk about us, for example? Um, yeah, I think uh, what really attracted my attention in that time after uh, it became uh, deliberate that uh, we will live in this era for a while, uh, I start seeing a lot of Kickstarter projects that started to prepare masks that might be more socially acceptable uh, in the uh, pub public areas. Of course, as you raised, uh, this is not about digital expresses, but I think it's very important to point out that then um, masks are becoming the norm. So the facial aug augmentations are becoming the norm. Uh, in that sense, I think they are quite overlapping with what we were talking because uh, you have shown a lot of examples of how to prevent uh, panopticon city, right, to, to observe us. And uh, still most of them are not very socially acceptable. They're weird garments. But now uh, I think we have more space to go weird. Uh, we have more uh, space to expand and a lot of uh, and we still don't know what's a norm for a mask, uh, especially if it's now a regular daily use object. Then we have a huge design space there that we could that we can expand for different kind of contexts, and uh, this would then, in the long term, can affect the panopticon city. Uh, if masks are norms, then how will you start recognizing the faces? Uh, which is, I think, a good thing uh, in, in, in terms of citizens. So uh, now they have maybe more means also culturally embedded at the end of the day to prevent this observation and surveillance all the time. Um, and of course, what do you think? Like, do you have any uh, interesting examples that you have come across during yeah. this time. Sure. So, of course, as we cannot really go outside, most of the examples we collect are from the internet and mm -hmm. often in the form of internet memes or, you know, funny images that are shown. But it's interesting because at the first glance, maybe one wouldn't think about someone wearing a mask as a transhuman. But in fact, these masks are often quite, you know, technologically sophisticated. You know, we cannot use just whatever in order to make a mask. At the same time, due to the mask shortage, we can see several quite inventive ways of trying to protect ourselves. And so we go around and see things like this, that 
you know, near a normal mask, we have these sort of bottles that we can wear on our hands in order to try to cover ourselves. Or we can even, you know, put more things and use, you know, plastic, uh, plastic bags and everything to try to put, you know, a barrier between us and the rest of the world, between us and, and the virus. <clears throat> and when people get creative, it can also become sort of fun. For example, there are people wearing bras, in other words, being this sort of movement or how to adapt your bra in order to, to be a mask. And despite this maybe not being the most you know, effective ways, still you can see people that immediately use this new space uh, for writing also to express themselves. Sometimes, again, in fun ways, like this uh, granny that looks like a tag because she's using you know, this very scary <coughs> sort, uh, sort of mask. But we also have you know, people using sanitary pads in their faces as form of mask. And you're never sure how much this is something you know, that you do to protect yourself or something that you do as a joke or something that you just do because it becomes you know, an occasion to, to play, to show yourself, to identify yourself. And we have, of course, also these very funny examples like uh, this guy in Spain that went around with this Tyrex costume that, of course, being plastic sort of puts, again, a barrier between you and still it wasn't enough to convince uh, this policeman to let him go out of isolation. And I, I think it was he was fined in the end. And of course, uh, as it becomes, again, a new space for writing, a new space for expressing ourselves, we can also use it to show uh, something about our identity. For example, yeah. this mask that, that also found it quite wonderful, for most of the people won't say much, but if you play Skyrim, it's, immediately evident what this mask is. So it's a mask that sort of mimicry the, the graphics of a very common video game and that writes the, the, how the object will be represented in the game on the mask itself, itself. And so this becomes immediately a system of recognizing other people that played and liked the game because they will notice it and it will become a, a mean of uh, expressing your identity as a gamer and as someone that loved that, that particular game. And this is very interesting because it sort of brings us towards the idea of fashion. You now mm -hmm. we saw already in the examples before that often also the uh, wearable technologies that we use not to be recognized, try to be fashionable, to look good, but at the same time um, also masks can, mm -hmm. can become fashionable. And I think also you saw many Kickstarter mm. projects that were dealing with this, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially, of course, I'm also uh, quite uh, interested in, as, as you also uh, raised, with cosplay, for example. Uh, masks are quite common to be used there, or the uh, facial augmentations. But when it comes to fashion, it even, I think, gets more interesting, because fashion uh, is, at the same time, is quite related with your identity. Uh, what you wear is showing the outside world who you are. Uh, even if you're not wearing specific things, even if you do not give a special uh, importance how you look, this is still a message to, to outside. Uh, and this is how it is positioned in, in, in the culture. And it is, I mean, as an individual person, you cannot just change it without wearing uh, fashionable clothes because not wearing them is also part of the fashion statement at the end of the day. And, uh, but what is really interesting here, uh, so when you think yourself, like imagine yourself, for example, in, in any place, you most probably will envision yourself with some kind of cloth. And uh, this is how we usually, uh, it, like depict our body. And this is how we usually show it to, outside world but faces are not like that faces are maybe the most humane part of our identity and maybe the most important part because of course you can recognize someone also from what they wear it is uh, more, more easy and a direct way to recognize someone from their faces but now in the daily norm we are starting we are starting covering them so we are losing this part of the identity uh, a little bit but of course then since uh, as we say fashion is part of the identity then fashion uh, companies also take over this space 
Uh, I believe you have some uh, examples also about this fashionable uh, interpretations of of uh, fashion masks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have a couple of images that I would like to show you. So the first one is from uh, a Japanese manufacturer. <laughs> so if you see this, maybe you can already start more or less to understand what it is, but the next image makes it very clear. So it's a bra manufacturer. They started to create masks for Japanese hospitals. And of course, I mean, they didn't just create masks using their machines, but they make masks that look like lingerie, basically. And so they want somehow to draw from all the imagery, you know, all the uh, mechanics of seduction that work inside lingerie on all this, you know, symbolic universe that rotates around it and, you know, sediment it in an object that otherwise is sort of scary. No sanitary masks are not necessarily something nice. They're something that we use to protect us, ourselves some, from something that is very scary. Mm -hmm. We have other examples like this it picture. Like, uh, I, I, I want to somehow like yes. make a comment on this. It's very interesting because uh, I mean like lingerie is, is hidden. Uh, not everyone sees it when you're walking around uh, outside. But now it also makes sense, right? Because lingerie is usually worn uh, over the naked body. And the face is the only naked place when you're fully uh, wear, wearing your clothes. Now it actually comes together very interestingly, although I think it started as a joke uh, by people who does that with their own lingerie. Then it also comes together interestingly, and I think it became viral very quickly what this company uh, did. So I don't know how it will work out at the end if people will use that, but uh, that's an that's an interesting take on, on that topic, and to also show how uh, the products can be appropriated when it comes to this new design spaces, because now there is a huge de design space that we didn't explore yet. Uh, we didn't explore daily usage masks a lot. Now there is a lot of exploration and most probably we will even see more uh, extreme examples of this. Yes, this is very interesting because it's also very cultural specific. Mm. So in Western culture, we decided at a certain point uh, of course, it's more complex than that, but you get me, <coughs> that the face is something that should be naked, that should be recognized. And from a long time, <coughs> we saw people wearing masks as people outside of the same sphere, which means people that are outside our culture. So it can be, for example, um, you know, thieves that wear masks not to be recognized. So they live outside the, the law, they live outside the, the, the civilized world or strangers. Now, there is this um, image, this small comic that I like very much. It's in Italian also, I will translate it from you. It comes from a very uh, famous uh, comic uh, artist, Nidai Colle Ortolani. <clears throat> and it's basically showing someone, uh, the guy with this sort of ears, that just woke up and is looking from the window and trying to un understand what's happening. You know? And the other guy tells him, look better at the face of the people. Like, ah, I see, Islam is one. That's a pity for Pope Francis. He even changed a player just before the, the end of the first half time. <coughs> so this is a joke, but it shows very well how, for example, we've often seen faces and covering faces, sorry, as something that Muslims do, or maybe Asian people do because their cities are, you know, so incredibly polluted, but not as something that we do. And so there is sort of a change in our perspective. There is another thing that I would like to show you, which is <clears throat> Trevor Noah speaking about wearing masks for black people. No, he say if black people don't wear masks, they are endangering others because, of course, they are spreading the virus. But if they do wear masks, they are treated like they are in Red Dead Redemption, which is a video game about cowboys. So they are treated like you know they are thugs because they are covering their face what they are planning. <clears throat> And he says, at this point, there is only one way for black people to cover their faces, is using masks that show a white face. And I think, again, this is a joke, but this is something that is very powerful <clears throat> because it shows how we still have some problems adapting to the fact that now people are wearing masks so often. 
and especially people like uh, you know African Americans that are already subject to institutionalized racism, etc., you know, risk a lot from covering their faces and not being recognized as you know good citizens doing this. But we could say that in the mainstream view now, if you don't wear a mask, you're a bad citizen. Especially in Italy right now, in many places, if you go out without a mask, they look at you as you know you're a murderer, basically. And this is a very big change that happened very very quickly. And it's interesting how, how people became enthusiastic about this, but also how people still are looking for ways of wearing masks without wearing masks. So there is this project that I find very interesting. It brings us back also to, to digital life resist. That is a startup that makes masks that look like your face. So they try to make masks that are sort of transparent without being transparent and that still keep you machine readable, which I think it's incredible. They say that, of course, it's so that you can unblock your phone, uh, you know, using facial recognition. But at the same time, it's again very convenient for the, for the panoptical city. So maybe if, you know, people will be forced to wear masks for longer periods, we shall see how this virus and, you know, new illnesses will come in the future. Maybe they will be forced to have masks that show their own face. <clears throat> so that they can be recognized. But this brings also to, you know, all new possibilities of, you know, a black market of face masks so that you can look like someone else, and, you know, all sort of strategies, again, not to be recognized despite wearing masks that are made to be transparent, which is, which is quite incredible in my opinion. What do you think of mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, the irony here is 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 incredible because uh, now we were talking in the beginning of this uh, this uh, conversation that masks can be a way, so uh, it might become at least a norm to cover your face in an era where ev everyone uh, is is watching you. There are a lot of surveillance, but now this kind of product comes up because machines, uh, like machines, cannot read you is actually a disadvantage. And I, I can really recognize that because now imagine all the people who have iPhones that can be only unlocked either by putting a long password or by seeing your face. So what you will do? Most probably you will buy one of those masks. And uh, it's also very interesting, uh, as, as you said. So now, it, uh, it was something alienating. It was something uh, very uh, stranger and alien to maybe the best Western culture. Uh, of course, it is not the case in, in other cultures, especially the Middle Eastern culture or Asian culture. But here, now, it's, it's a new thing. And it starts to become a norm. And now when I go outside, which I do really rarely, just to go to market, I sometimes see people that wears masks, and it is not still very common to wear mask, masks in, in Finland. But I even can encounter some people who wears them and then actually shape their other clothes around that. For example, they also wear a colorful glass with that, or also they cover uh, their head with a uh, hood that has some colorful uh, fluffy hairs around it. And they actually create this interesting uh, look in the face, which is somehow very interesting and new to me because it's not like masquerading. It's not a costume. Now it's a part of your daily life. And they're making a style around it, not just by changing the mask, but changing everything that they wear around this mask. Uh, this is very interesting. And I think uh, this is a point where this will also expand through the body. Uh, as we have talked also in the beginning with uh, examples such as Monarch and Spider Dress. But I also have some uh, other examples like how then face can be used uh, to, for example, uh, sculpt your body. Like there is this really uh, beautiful example by Anna Rakevich. Uh, and you see now the face is open. Uh, it's not a mask exactly, but uses the face as a mounting area and sculpts and create a sculpture that will shape around the face. And then it changes her body as you see here. Sorry, I'm not as experienced as you, 
<laughs> yeah, I have to move here. Okay, so <laughs> as, as, as you see, like now, uh, all the body suet is, is really a difference. And it's not, I mean, this is a kind of an old project. There was no such things uh, of masks become a norm at that time. But I can even see that they can go to these uh, extremes. Uh, in terms of making even more acceptable or more avant-garde in the in the daily life and of course why not it's a interesting take uh, about covering your face uh, because now you change it now and you will change you will start changing around it and uh, here uh, of course then you may also you may have uh, experienced that uh, sometimes when i go to market if it's a short time like for example i go to I, sometimes i go to buy a wine or something so i just don't want to wash all my clothes and uh, i don't want to have a shower after this short trip when i come to home so i wear some stuff on 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 my body like i wear my coat then i wear my hood i close the zip as much as possible so there is no COVID coming inside me and then this changes all my proprioception I have hardships in moving in them then it gets really hot but I cannot remove them so I become a I immediately become another person that looks a bit maybe shady because I move in an interesting way uh, slowly carefully and even disrupted by others around me at that time because now i'm in the identity of person who does the social distancing very carefully because of all the clothes that i wear and even in the in, the, in my last trip to um store i accidentally dropped one of my beers because i was trying to be so fast and i was disturbed and <laughs> i was uh obstacled by my clothes so it changed a lot of things and yes, it will uh, go towards that and, and it will affect how you perceive yourself. And it might be even uh, exemplified in a better way when it comes to, for example, health workers or, or other types of jobs that needs full body suits. Um, yeah, and as you say, this uh, brings still us back to the encoded cognition, yeah. Yeah, that's good that you have the example. Yeah. Want to talk but, about that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, not not really, because I think that uh, you said something I found very interesting. It was this sort of you know ast astronaut feeling you have when you go out with all this clothing, which is something that here in Finland we also quite often uh, experience in winter. So uh, for who never experienced a very cold winter, when outside is minus twenty five. You wear so many strata of clothes that when you go out, you really walk like an astronaut. You cannot really move your body too much, and you really feel that you need to protect yourself from the outside environment. <clears throat> and I think it's something very interesting because, as you say, it, uh, I mean, if there is a pragmatical um, side, a practical side in which we just, you know, protect ourselves from cold or from virus or whatever it changes a lot how we can uh, act and how we perceive ourselves in the environment around us. So there is this example that became sort of famous that is also quite fun of this COVID romance, which is these people that met each other by seeing each other uh, on rooftops during quarantine and he gave her his number using a drone and when they first met he came inside this bubble and he came inside this bubble with some flowers but then he couldn't give flowers to her because he's inside the bubble. Something as basic as giving to the person became impossible for this sort of uh, strange garment he's wearing all around him. And uh, while, of course, we all hope that this situation is not something that uh, will last for a very long time, at the same time, we can see, for example, uh, in, uh, in science fiction, many examples of this sort of suit that we need to wear to survive. Uh, for example, in Dune, we have uh, here the new version uh, that will come out soon in 2020 by Denis Villeneuve, and here the one from David Lynch from 1984. 
the people living in this planet Agathis, which is a desert planet following uh, a climate catastrophe. So we can already feel, you know, some, um, you know, inspiration for real life too. As this place is extremely dry, the workloads that recuperate the moisture from the skin, from, the, from their breath, etc., and retransform it in water they can drink, because water becomes, you know, such such a precious a precious resource. And so it is something that at least in science fiction has been envisioned, and that of course changes uh, a lot how the people of this uh, possible society live. But there is another interesting thing I think that emerges from uh, from what you say, that is that you try to go out as little as possible. Only really when, you know, the wine is finished and uh, or we need food or the toilet paper or whatever. And this is also something that I think is very relevant for what we're saying, because we're talking about transurbanism, but urban spaces are often semi-deserted right now. And all the interactions that we would normally have, or at least many of them, that we would normally have in the city spaces moved online moved on Zoom, like we're doing uh, right now. You know, so many meetings, but also chatting with friends, etc. We now do uh, through these, um, uh, these technologies. And again, digital exercises come on play. Because, for example, what we, uh, what both me and Oz are doing now, so using this nice uh, uh, Aurora Borealis background, it's also based on the face that on the fact that it recognizes our faces, but not like for example, my hands sometimes become invisible. And so when we were preparing this, we, we played a little bit. So we show you a couple, a couple of things. Because how does Zoom recognize your face? What is needed for him to recognize the face? So we show you a bunch of other stuff. So for example, I, I'm holding some that you're not seeing right now, but it looks like a face. But if I get out of the screen, it will become visible. If I come back in the screen, it becomes invisible again. If I go out, again, visible. So it's looking for a face, and if it doesn't find it, it looks for the next best thing. So we try to understand you know, how much something needs to look like a face in order to be recognized. So for example, this is very, very basic and it still recognizes it as a face and shows it. But even something that is, you know, merely more or less spherical, whatever color you use, is recognized as a face, but not other objects, which is quite interesting. And we also tried playing, for example, if I take other objects, like a piece of paper that is invisible, what happens? Can I become invisible? Is the paper that becomes visible? Am I without a head? how much of my face is needed in order to be recognized by Zoom and shown, and shown as a face. And uh, yes, I had a lot of fun spending my afternoon yesterday doing these experiments. <laughs> but um, I think this is a very basic thing. But what is interesting is that, of course, right now you're not seeing my face. You're seeing a prosthesis of my face. Now my face is back in Finland. And this prosthesis is also something that is quite easy to augment. And I think also there's a couple of also very funny things to show you on how we can augment these digital processes of our faces. Yeah, yeah. I think the first thing that I want to show is something really basic that comes to my mind uh, when I was thinking, what can I wear digitally in, in Zoom? Because I work on wearables and I come up with this thought that, okay, and now I'm mostly digital because this is how I talk to everyone. And of course, I have my clothes, but what can be more? Like, what can this uh, really simple mechanism of Zoom provide me with? So I came up with this really simple uh, manipulation of my background. Uh, and in, in one of the online conferences that we were, we were hosting, I decided to become a, a dark angel or... or uh, something like that. I don't know. I just want to wear uh, the wings behind me. And it was really interesting. Like every, it really attracted uh, everyone's attention immediately. And uh, now I'm thinking like, how can I expand that? Uh, how, how can I uh, bring more into uh, this digital space of, of wearing things? Of course, the most 
basic thing was to making it white because one friend just in the in the last meeting uh, complained that it was too dark. So I said, okay, why not? Like, let's make it a little bit more uh, lighter then. Uh, so this was the very basic uh, manipulation, and um, as, as we talk now, to clothes, of course, we don't know if they are clothes or if we will perceive them as clothes in, in any time soon, but at least uh, I see it as a way to manipulate our silhouette or body and what our body represents in, in the digital environments. But of course, there are even things beyond that. Again, in the same conference, we have designed this uh, game uh, that hosts an imaginary character. So I modeled this imaginary character uh, in, in a 3D software. And then I found some other software that rigs my face and tried to become it. I will just start this uh, and I don't know if it will take some time uh, to start that, maybe not. But with that, uh, you can actually turn into something else. Uh, and since I am digital now, uh, usually, uh, why not? I mean, what happens if I represent myself all the time with weird av avatars? Uh, what will my identity become? And uh, how I will be able to uh, represent it or if it will change anything about me. These are all interesting questions, but first. So yeah, in that, in that conference, I actually uh, turn into an interesting uh, character uh, that actually you can show, see it uh, tracks me, tracks my mouth, and even I can change the characters here uh, in, in, in different ways, for example, uh, I don't know, it can be a tiger. Oh, I need to also... <laughs> now, as you see, Zoom doesn't recognize it because <laughs> it doesn't recognize tiger faces, as far as I understand. <laughs> yeah, but, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, you can, you can change the characters that you can embody here. Uh, you can, for example... If you if you somehow envy this T-Rex person, you can at least become some kind of dino. And of course, that's interesting because you have to behave uh, according to how computer will recognize your facial movements. So if I want to be looked to talk, I need to have more uh, expressive self -expre uh, facial expressions. And even I don't know anything. This hamburger is is is, is a great one. And if you want, <laughs> I can just continue the presentation as a hamburger from now on. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what is really interesting here is imagine yourself as a hamburger all the time when you represent yourself in the online, uh, in your online persona. Imagine yourself as being I don't know a businessman, businesswoman that always in, in, the, in the meetings and you embody something different. Uh, of course, this is very cartoonish, uh, but it can be something also very realistic that can change your identity without uh, no, one, no one else recognizing it. So uh, these are some uh, kind of interesting examples that a digital life here can provide us. But as we started the talk, the digital expresses part, uh, to do all of them, this digital world needs to read our face. And these are, of course, simple examples, right? Uh, because then it reads our face just for maybe entertainment or just for changing our background. But let's now take this uh, into the other part. Uh, I want to embody my real body right now. Uh, oh, and I need to put my background immediately. Yes. So let's imagine ourselves in the reverse of that position. Okay. So far, we talked about how to augment our face, how to put masks on it. And when it comes to digital expresses, 
how to avoid the recognition of the city, recognition of the trans uh, ur urbanistic uh, like panopticon. And of course, when it's in the trans urbanism part, as Mattia said here, it's not just face, but maybe everything. But what we, what we avoid here is to escape from machine to know us, machine to recognize us. But what happens when it's vice versa? What happens when we want machine to recognize us, when we want to communicate with the machine through our face? How does this change our behavior? And I have an interesting example here. Uh, we were testing some kind of gaming variables recently, and one of the games were about recognizing facial expressions. And they, in, in that game, aim was to express your, for example, sadness or your happiness or your, or your anger in the most expressive way. So the computer actually gives you a point about how sad or how happy you are. And if you get more points, you're winning the game. Uh, and it was a social game. So two persons are looking to each other and they are trying to be the most expressive. And it was very weird, embarrassing, and awkward for most of the participants because they were doing this uh, very alien uh, facial moves uh, to someone that they don't know. Uh, so when you laugh, you laugh, but when you try to laugh as best as you can, it starts to become weird because then you start feeling your facial muscles and how you control them. And you're trying to think yourself as if you're laughing enough. Uh, then it actually uh, disrupts all the emotion and experience there. And in that sense, communicating with machines is really interesting because then you have to think about your digital expresses all the time. If, if machine could write you in the right way, so it recognized you and you could communicate with them. And I think that's a very interesting, uh, that has a very interesting impact on how, will you, how we will identify us in that kind of era. What do you think, Mattia, about that? Definitely. Also because it sort of brings facial expressions from something that is, you know, just borderline semiotic to something that is fully semiotic. Hmm. Why? Because facial expressions are something that, uh, of course, not in every case, but something that when it's, let's say, honest, is something that we're not lying with, it's something that comes, you know, naturally from our face. And learning to control it is a technique, it's something we do with, with time. And for example, I always find interesting um, when small children try to make a, a prank, they cannot do it without smiling or laughing. So they give immediately away the fact that they are lying because they cannot yet control their face in order to, to lie with their expression. Of course, becoming adults, we, we learn to lie better and uh, also with, with our facial expressions. But when our face is brought in a context of machine readability, the level of consciousness that we need to put into it, it becomes even greater. Also because there was this uh, example we made when we were discussing about how to pre prepare this presentation, if we think, for example, at a very basic and very common way in which we want <coughs> a machine to read us, that is uh, the, the passport picture, we see how bad we are at not conveying emotions while we try to take those kind of pictures. <laughs> so we try to follow some sort of you know, formal uh, guidelines and we end up looking upset, dangerous, uh, drunk or whatever but never looking natural. And and actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I really want to go uh, here because there is, uh, we, in Turkey, we have a comedian called uh, Cem Yubas, and he's one of the most famous in Turkey. And he has a really great joke about this passport pictures. He is saying that I saw a lot of people who tried to look like, who put some effort to look like as if in the, as, as if in their passport pictures in front of this passport officers. And that's a very interesting analogy, I think, that goes to machine reading in that sense, because that this passport ofi uh, officer there is the guy or the woman who wants to just recognize you. It's a machine for you. It's a, there's, 
nothing more than that most probably because you just want to pass the border and you just want them to know you recognize you so uh, as you say your picture in the passport is very different than your emotional self then you start uh, to contract your muscles in your face to become the picture in this passport and it's a very interesting take i think on on that subject yeah also because both you and the border guard are adopting a language that is a machine language mm -hmm. so you're not taking a normal <laughs> picture and the guard is not looking at you to recognize you in a normal way you try to look as a picture that you made to be recognizable digitally and the guard is looking at the same thing that the machine would be looking to try to recognize it. Yeah. And so it shows how this digital emphasis then really enters also in human to human communication. And we can imagine that if uh, machine readability becomes a thing, there is a very interesting video, so maybe we will post it in the, in the description of the video. It's called Belief System, it's by Bernhard mm -hmm. Offengartner. <laughs> it's a design, a speculative design experiment that imagines a world in which our emotions are perfectly readable by machines. And in, imagine a bunch of situations in education, marketing, and, uh, uh, purchase of goods, etc. And in one of those, he imagined, for example, that people will try to learn to control even the you know, unconscious movements of their faces in order to gain an advantage not to be recognized. But again, as we're doing with the, you know, the, these digital avatars that uh, Oz was using before, we can also try to exaggerate our movements in order to be better read by the machine. And it's difficult right now to imagine how much this could affect the way in which we use our face in every aspect of our face, on our lives. And so finally, this digital emphasis becomes, uh, you know, a way of uh, of thinking. It becomes part of our semiosphere. So it becomes part of the way in which we use our face to communicate also in everyday, in everyday situations. Potentially, of course, we're speaking about the future, but I think it's not, you know, that, that impossible to imagine if we see that some examples like the one of, of the passport pictures already exist, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and it's, we have talked a lot about facial uh, augmentation so far. And I think it uh, goes both ways because now we have talked that we re augment our faces so machines wouldn't uh, recognize us. But at the same time, when it comes to more sophisticated interaction with machines, it's also not enough, right? Uh, it's not e because you have to really exert yourself to machine to understand what your emotion is. Uh, and then you can still augment your face. So machine can read your face in a better way. Maybe, I don't know, you will augment your face with some kind of devices which is connected to your uh, neurons that will do some kind of shapes according to your emotions, then uh, it will be better readable by machines if it's a must. Uh, and it is, as we gave the example, now it's a must at least to be recognized by your iPhone so you can easily access it. And it can get even go beyond when emotions and this emotional recognition, recognition systems are part of our daily life. And um, in that sense, imagining how, how machines write, how you look, uh, I think will have, as I said, a lot of impact in how we also see ourselves at the end of the day. Uh, so we are, we are coming to a closing of our conversation. Me and Oz could continue speaking about these things forever. <laughs> but uh, I think that the video is becoming long enough like this. Um, I hope this um, more, you know, free and dialogic part of the video is not too confusing for the viewers. I think that what we try to represent is sort of the complexity of this relation between phase, its possible augmentations and the technologies we can put on it, and uh, the machine that looks at it, reads it, and uh, try to identify it or to interpret it in different ways. And uh, maybe to conclude, um, we would like to, to propose a last reflection, that if we look about uh, you know, cyberpunk literature, which is often the kind of uh, novels or movies, TV series, et cetera, 
in which transhumanism is most often represented. Well, we often see that um, the, the only thing that stays is the faith. No? People can change all their body, every single part of them, without losing their humanity, but they keep their human faith because that's what makes them recognizable. Which is quite interesting, because if we look at what's going on right now, it would seem that faith is, in fact, one of the first things that we are augmenting while we move towards transhumanism. <clears throat> be it for health, be it for hiding from the panopticon city, but it becomes immediately one of the first things that we are ready to renegotiate. And in this way, it almost looks like we're going, you know, on the opposite side of what uh, cyberpunk uh, literature used to imagine. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, it is it is a very interesting point uh, to see at least this picture just behind you, because this is what what we were thinking. The face is is the most important identification point of a, of a person and maybe your humane part at the end of the day. But now, uh, then we like today we talked about first the masks because of COVID. Then we try to understand how this masks actually affects your identity. Then uh, we came to be recognized by the machine in also our daily life and also because we are now always inside and talk to machines. And then in the last point, we came up to this conclusion, okay, augmenting face can be one thing for escaping from the machine, but it can be also a one way to get closer to the machine. So it looks like that from that ideation, augmenting the face is very likely in either case. And yes, this is how it's depicted in cyberpunk literature. But it's, I think, for me at least, kind of exciting to see how it will turn out maybe mm -hmm. 100 years ago when we really, uh, when we really upgrade and enhance our bodies like that. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, we, we all look forward with a mix of you know, enthusiasm and fear mm -hmm. to what, what the future will bring to our faces. So, well, thank you to all of you that got until the end of this video. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot have a real moment of discussion and question and answer uh, online. But of course, uh, feel free to you know leave comments, etc. We will periodically check the video and uh, and answer any question, or you can contact us. And uh, I show you the, um, our contacts at the beginning of the video, so you can just go back there and write us an email or whatever. Um, thank you very much. Thank you all for this very interesting conversation. Yeah, thank you. I also thank everyone and I also thank specific, uh, specifically to you and the uh, Turin team for <laughs> have, having me uh, also as the guest. Wonderful. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye.